Okay, so today begins the second half of the course. And we have to do some more sections having to do with acid base equilibria. And uh, the remaining two sections you can see in front of you here, at least the subtitles. Buffer solutions first, which will probably take up the entire lecture, and then titrations, titration calculations, and related issues. So, buffer solutions. First, let me try and explain in general terms what a buffer solution is. Um, in many cases <clears throat> in chemistry and biochemistry, we need to make sure that a solution maintains a constant pH value. To put it another way, we want to prevent any possible changes in pH if somebody were to, for instance, accidentally spill some H plus into the solution or some OH minus, right? That would normally cause a change in pH. We want to prevent that. That's what a buffer solution is intended to do. Um, before even launching into the details of buffers, we're going to do a section on what's called the common ion effect. And we begin by considering the ionization of a weak acid, such as hydrogen fluoride, ionizes to form F minus and H plus. And we're going to examine what is the effect of adding a common ion. And that means either some additional F minus or some additional H plus. So first I'm going to do an equilibrium calculation that looks like or that assumes that we have not yet added the common ion. So this is just about the ionization of the weak acid. So you'll have seen this kind of thing before. We begin with a concentration of 0.5 molar hydrogen fluoride. And initially, it hasn't ionized. So there'll be a zero here and a zero there for the ions that are formed. OK, we know the Ka for the acid that's given. At equilibrium, we will have X and X on the right-hand side, and the initial concentration minus X on the left-hand side. Now we're going to assume we can use the approximation method. And we're going to say that Ka is equal to the product of the product concentrations, namely X squared, divided by this but we have assumed that this X has tended to zero and makes no difference to the 0.5, right? This is the on the assumption that the 5% rule is okay. And remember, we can only do that in advance. We can't, we can't justify the, the approximation until we've actually discovered what X equals. But it turns out that if you solve for X here by taking the square root of that product, you will get 1.8 times 10 to the minus two. And it turns out that that is within the 5% rule. I didn't show it here, but you can check it if you're, uh, if you're interested. Now consider what share. happens. Sure, yeah, Emily. Uh, do we, like, would it be wrong if we didn't use the 5% um, rule and we just use the quadratic formula? No, it would, no, it would be better, okay. Thank you. in fact, because we would get a, a more accurate value. Yeah. Um, now consider what happens on the addition of the common ion. And we're going to do this with another equilibrium calculation in which instead of writing 0 0.5, 0, and 0, this time we're going to say that initially we have 0 .0, uh, 0 0.1 of H+. plus. That this is due to the common ion. This is due to the, what is the effect of adding a common ion? And we're assuming that we've added 0.1 M HCl. Now, because HCl is a strong acid, we know that it's going to produce 0.1 of H plus. So that's where I'm getting that 0.1 from. Now, what happens at equilibrium? Well, x for f minus, 0.1 plus x for h plus, and 0.5 minus x on the left-hand side. 
Now substitute that into an equilibrium expression. The value of Ka is the product of the product concentrations divided by the reactant concentration. So here's what it looks like before making the approximation. And now we're going to let this x tend to zero. And we're going to let that x tend to zero. But we're not going to let this x tend to zero. We can't let, we can't do the calculation if we let them all go to zero. So it's a bit like we did before, right? Only this time it so happens that even in the numerator, we've got that approximation. Right? So assume that x is much smaller than 0.1, and of course, even smaller than 0.5. What now is left is x times 0.1 divided by 0.5 on the right hand side. If we solve for x, we will find that x is 3.4 times 10 to the minus 3. Now, what does that mean? If you compare it with what x was up here without the common iron, x was 1.8 times 10 to the minus 2. And on the addition of the common iron, its value has been reduced roughly by a factor of 5. Right? It's now in the 3.4 times 10 to the minus 3 as compared with the original 1.8 times 10 to the minus 2, roughly speaking, 5. Conclusion. The presence of a common ion suppresses the ionization of the acid. We've seen that, right? Because here's the common ion. And now, instead of having a F minus concentration that we had before, we've got a value that's one fifth of what it was before. And that is taken to mean that the hydrogen fluoride is not ionizing as much as it was before. All right, so in general terms, presence of common ion suppresses ionization of the weak acid. And that's an important oh, professor. Oh, sorry. Okay, right. Several questions. Go ahead. Um, mind if I go first? Oh. So how would we represent the HCl in the balanced equation? Because right now, just the hydrogen ion is there. Um, why is only the hydrogen ion there? I don't follow exactly what you mean. Er, if we're adding HCl, shouldn't we have HCl somewhere in the uh, equilibrium oh, equation? Mean, oh, I see. The, the Cl minus appears to have disappeared. Yeah. OK. That's that's. It would have to be included, but we're really not interested in that. Okay. Okay, because we didn't have that before, but you're right. It, it seems to have slipped off the, the scene. If you were to, to really spell out everything that's there, it would have to be included. I agree. We're considering it as a spectator iron, meaning it's there looking, but it's not doing anything. It certainly doesn't. All right. Thank anything. you. Okay. Any, there was a second question, maybe? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was going to ask if you had added like a weak acid as opposed to HCl, which is a strong acid, and then it didn't like fully dissociate, would Correct. the results of the common ion effect be different? Um, it would obviously be different because we couldn't make that assumption here. We would have a far smaller value there if it was a weak acid, of course. Okay. So it would have a smaller common ion effect, should we say but it would have an effect. Yeah, anything that's done to that initial equilibrium is gonna have an influence. I've chosen to work with a strong acid for, for the sake of simplicity so that I could go straight from there to there. Otherwise I would have, have to have solved a quadratic. Any other questions on this? All right. Now, we could have made a similar prediction using Le Chatelier's principle. Although I criticized the use of this the other day, I did say that when it came to concentration, there, there are no ambiguities with concentration. It works perfectly, even if you use the version that says it opposes the change. What do I mean? Well, here's HF ionizing, 
Comenine effect means add some H plus or some F minus. What is the effect on the position of equilibrium? Well, it opposes the increase of H plus by driving the equilibrium towards the left. Or the position of equilibrium moves to the left. And that means uh, it confirms that the ionization of this weak acid has been suppressed, has been reduced. So we reach the same conclusion much more quickly and qualitatively. Right? The, the, the first approach was better because we calculated just how much it was suppressed. But here we can just say it has suppressed it. Now, the reason why I'm talking about common iron in preparation for discussing buffer solutions is because buffer solutions contain typically an acid and its conjugate base. And the conjugate base is a common iron. Let me now move in to the beginnings of the explanation of what is a buffer solution. A mixture of a weak acid on it and its conjugate base, for instance, acetic acid, its conjugate base is CH3COO minus. You remember the talk of acid base conjugate pairs, they differ by an H plus. Now, it happens to be sodium acetate in my example. It could have been any acetate. It could have been calcium acetate, magnesium acetate, potassium acetate. Again, this is an example that this is just a spectator ion. It's not going to matter. This is the one that matters. So, weak acid and conjugate base. But the conjugate base is actually an example of a common ion, as you'll see more clearly in just a moment. Another way to have a buffer solution is instead of taking a weak acid and its conjugate base, take a weak base and its conjugate acid. Right? Here's a weak base and its conjugate acid is NH4+. Once again, this happens to be one example. It didn't have to be the chloride, it could have been the bromide, the iodide, there's anything you like. The relevant part is the NH4+. Okay. A buffer solution, as I mentioned earlier, is intended to resist changes in pH on the addition of, as it says here, small amounts of H plus or OH minus are added. I mean, no buffer solution is intended to resist any change in pH. If somebody comes along with a bucket full of H plus, then of course, and throws it into the solution, of course, no pH, no buffer solution is going to withstand that change. Right? Again, this will be made quantitative in a moment where we'll see what are the limits. How much can you add before getting a change? Just as an example, a biological example, because biology and biochemistry features many examples of buffer solutions, natural buffers. Biology has developed buffer solutions in the body, say, in order to keep pH of certain mechanisms constant. For instance, the, the blood, human blood needs to remain with this very, within this very narrow range of pH. Three point, uh, so rather 7.35 to 7.45, right? A 0.1 pH range. There's a buffer solution that evolution has created or developed in order to do that. We are studying simple buffers, but eventually you'll be going on to biological buffer solutions. Okay. Let's now do, as it says here, a qualitative approach in which we attempt to explain why, how does the buffer solution actually work? Why does the presence of a weak acid and this conjugate base able to resist the addition of H plus or OH minus. Now to do that, I'm writing out the buffer solution in this particular way. I've got a, a reaction showing the ionization of the acetic acid, right? Weak acid forming H plus plus the conjugate base. And then I've written this out again. The reason being that remember, 
a buffer solution is a weak acid plus its conjugate base. In other words, we have an excess of conjugate base. Not only do we have the conjugate base that comes about when this ionizes, but we're deliberately putting more of it in. That's the common ion, if you like. That's the additional common ion, right? Just like in the previous example, I added some H plus. Well, I'm adding more of this this time. Okay. So how does this work? How does this perform the magic of resisting addition of OH minus or addition of H plus? So supposing someone spills a little bit of OH minus into the buffered solution. But what happens is that the OH minus will react with undissociated acid to form CH3CO minus. So now we've got even more of this stuff and H2O. the pH remains constant. Had we not knocked out this OH minus, then this OH minus would have reacted with that H plus, right? And the pH would have changed, but it's not reacting with that H plus because it's been eaten up by this undissociated acetic acid. So it's like, it's as if we're diverting it away from, from its ability to change the pH. Okay. Now that also begins to explain to us why it is that a buffer is a weak acid and its conjugate base, not a strong acid. Because had this been a strong acid, it would all have ionized immediately, 100%, and we wouldn't have had any undissociated acid to be able to perform this reaction. Therefore, a buffer must involve a weak acid or a weak base, but we're looking at the weak acid example, not a strong acid. Now, what happens if a person walks into the room and throws in some H plus? Will the pH change? The answer is no, it won't, because in the buffered solution, we've got an excess of this acetate ion, and the acetate ion will react with H plus, that's been added, and what will form? More acetic acid, right? If we hadn't done that, there would have been a change in the H plus concentration. It would have gone up, therefore the pH would have gone down. We're preventing that from happening, or rather the buffer solution is preventing that from happening by this clever maneuver, whereby the excess of that, and that's why you need an excess of this. Because if you didn't have an excess of this, you only had this acetate ion, right? Then you would be changing the initial equilibrium and you would be changing the pH. Meaning this would react with that and there would be a change to that equilibrium. Let's put it that way. That equilibrium would change. As a result, there'd be a different H plus concentration. Therefore, a buffer has a sort of a dual nature. The OH minus is removed by the presence of the weak undissociated acid. The H plus is removed by the presence of excess conjugate base. And that's why it has this two part nature, weak acid and conjugate base. Weak acid will take care of um, incoming OH minus, conjugate base in excess will take care of any incoming H plus. Okay, one further point. We can also select the pH value that we wish to have the buffer solution work at. Say we want a solution to be buffered at pH value three. Well, we can do that. We can do that by varying the concentrations of the weak acid and its conjugate base. And in a moment, we will see this in a quantitative way. Now it's just being stated qualitatively. It can be done. Any questions? Professor? Yeah. 
like, where does uh, the common ion effect like relate to the buffer solution? All right. I don't understand. Uh, this is the common ion. This has served the purpose because it's been added. You see, a, a buffer solution is not just a weak acid. It's a weak acid plus its conjugate base. The presence of the conjugate base has actually done two things. It has suppressed the ionization of the weak acid to be sure that we have excess weak acid to be able to do this. Secondly, it is going to be able to react with any incoming H plus to not upset that equilibrium. And so to, to maintain the initial amount of H plus that was in there. If you didn't do that, if you didn't divert the incoming H plus in this fashion with the common ion, right, you would have had an increase in H plus concentration and you would have therefore seen a lowering of pH. But to come back to your specific question, right, the common ion is this. It's the conjugate base, which is, of course, a common ion to this equilibrium. It's, it's this one. Okay, Ibrahim? Yes, okay, thank you. All right. Um, if buffers are only for weak acids, does that mean that there's no way for strong acids to prevent changes in pH? Absolutely right. So once more, if it had been a strong acid, going back to here, all of it would have ionized. Therefore, it could not have taken care of this step here. Okay? It could not have reacted with any incoming OH minus because by definition, a strong acid means it all goes towards the right in its reaction shown in number one here. So it has to be a weak acid to stand any chance of acting in this fashion. Now, let's begin to bring it, to make it quantitative. This requires the derivation of what's called the Henderson-Hasselbach equation, discovered by two individuals more or less at the same time, sometimes simply known as the Henderson equation. Sometimes it's known as the Hasselbach equation. Okay. We begin with the ionization of a weak acid. Completely general now. Hx goes to H plus plus X minus. We write a Ka expression for this ionization. H plus times X minus, the product of the products, divided by the concentration of the reactant. Right? We were doing this when we were doing equilibrium calculations earlier. Now just rearrange this a little bit to make H plus the subject. So H plus is going to be Ka times concentration of acid divided by concentration of conjugate base. Now we take negative logs on each side of this equation. So on the left, we have negative log of H plus, And on the right, we have negative log of this whole thing. Negative log Ka Hx over X minus. Now we apply the well-known log identity, which says that the log of AB is equal to the log of A plus the log of B, which will allow us to separate the right-hand side to look like this, minus log of Ka minus the log of this quotient. Right? We've just separated it out. This is the A and this is the B, if you like. The negative signs, of course, come from the fact that we're taking negative log on each side. Okay, we're almost at the end of the derivation. And now, just for the sake of convenience, or rather, let, let me do this first. What is negative log of H plus? Well, it's pH. What is negative log of Ka? It, well, we'll just keep that as negative. Uh, ah, we will call that pKa in a moment. And finally, instead of keeping this as negative log of 
h x over x minus, we're going to invert it. And we're going to invert it by making use of another log identity. The log of a divided by b is the same thing as the negative log of b over a. So the negative sign becomes a positive sign and the quotient has been inverted. Right. That last step is just because we prefer to have positives than negatives in our equation. Right. It was not demanded by, the, by anything more than that. And this, of course, is pKa. The negative log of Ka is pKa. So here finally is the Henderson-Hasselbach equation. The pH of the buffer solution is going to be the pKa of whatever acid is being used plus the log of that ratio. The X minus concentration divided by the acid concentration. In other words, the total conjugate base concentration divided by the acid concentration. Okay, let's see a worked example. Calculate the pH of a solution containing lactic acid, 0.75 molar. Lactic acid is a weak acid. And by the way, lactic acid in biology is important because when muscles get tired, there is a buildup of lactic acid. And the conjugate ion of lactic acid is, is called lactate. Here it happens to be sodium lactate. The sodium is irrelevant. It could have been any lactate, potassium, magnesium, calcium, right? So we've got the concentration of both of them. And we can then substitute into the henderson hasselbach The pH of the buffer solution is the pKa, so negative log to base 10 of this value, plus the log of that quotient, the lactate concentration, 0.25 divided by the acid concentration, 0.75. This, when calculated, works out to be 3.85. This, when calculated, turns out to be negative 0.47. When you put the two results together, you get the pH of the buffer solution to be equal to 3.38. Now, just to solidify this, I'd like you to try this example that's of the same kind, and I've now written the henderson hasselbach in blue letters there. pH is pKa plus the log of that quotient. See if you can do it now, please. Okay, is that enough time? Just a little longer, maybe. Good, one person saying yes. Another person agreeing that it's enough time. Another one. Okay, and yet another one, and yet another one. 
Okay. Now, the working. I've repeated the question. Henderson Hasselbach says, pH of the buffer solution is pKa of the acid in question. The acid in question is carbonic and its, P its Ka is 4.2 times 10 to the minus seven. So we're gonna to need to find the negative log of that plus the log of the quotient, which is conjugate base concentration 0 0.035 divided by acid concentration, which is 0 0.0035. By the way, these were molar amounts, but because they were in one liter, we can instantly convert them into concentrations. Concentration being mole, moles per liter. That, of course, reads as the log of 10. And the log of 10 is quite simply 1, right? And therefore, the pH of the buffer solution is whatever value this came to. Uh, this is before taking significant figures, plus 1. And it turns out, therefore, to be 7.38 to two significant figures, given that the question featured two significant figures here and here, and here. This happened to be four significant figures, but of course we go for the lowest significant figure. Okay, so this is how you calculate pH of a buffer solution. You need to know the concentrations of the acid and its conjugate base, and you need to know the Ka value for the acid itself. Any questions on that calculation? All right. Now let's go back to one step in the derivation, which I did back on that page there. All right, precisely this step. The H plus equals Ka times that quotient, right? I'm gonna start with that. There it is. And first of all, I'm just gonna identify what this all means. The Ka, of course, comes from the identity of the weak acid, meaning it's going to have a different value for every weak acid, whether it be acetic or lactic or carbonic that we just used. Right? It, each one has an individual Ka. That quotient, as I'm calling it, that ratio is due, of course, to the concentration of the acid and of the conjugate base. Now, how will all this change on the addition of small amounts of OH minus or H plus? Now we're in a position to be able to give a quantitative explanation. One thing I should say before moving on to this is when I did the earlier qualitative explanation, I might have given the impression that there was absolutely no change in pH. Right? This seemed to be the perfect recipe. If OH minus comes in, it gets knocked out. If H plus comes in, it gets knocked out. And the solution is exactly what pH it was before the intruding H plus or H minus. Right? In reality, it's not quite as neat as that. We're now getting more specific. We're now getting quantitative. We can explore whether it really does make absolutely no change to the pH. And the simple answer is it, it will make, it, or better, better put, it may make a difference. So what happens to that ratio on the addition of OH minus? Well, here's the equilibrium due to the acid. When you add OH minus to that equilibrium, it eats up some of that HX in reacting, and it forms H2O plus X minus. And that means that the value of HX concentration is lowered, and the value of X minus concentration is raised, which means that ratio changes. It doesn't remain the same. Okay which means that in principle, the value of H plus will change, which in turn means that the pH will change. But 
if the initial values of those two quantities were both large, then the relative change that's been brought about by the addition of OH minus will be small and maybe insignificant. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, here's a nice picture that illustrates these points. In the middle, we have a representation of the concentration of weak acid and its conjugate base. The weak acid is in pink, the conjugate base is in blue. The, the columns are fairly tall. They're high concentrations, let's say five molar of each one. Okay. If somebody spills some OH minus into the solution, what happens again is that the OH minus will react with the HX. This gets eaten up and this gets created. Therefore, the columns now look like this. The blue column has grown taller. The pink column has decreased in magnitude. Now, if this going up and going down is small compared to the length of that whole column, then the change may turn out to be insignificant. The other option would be that somebody walks into the room and throws some H plus into the buffered solution. What happens? The throwing in of H plus is going to mean that you react with X minus to form HX. The pink column grows and the blue column shrinks. Once again, provided these two are very large to begin with, then the, the, the up and down may be insignificant. We're about to calculate just how significant or otherwise that's going to be. Okay. So we're examining the effect on that ratio. That's what the blue and pink columns are doing. They're expressing that ratio and they're expressing the change in that ratio on whichever calamity occurs, the addition of OH minus, the addition of H plus. Okay. So let's take an example and actually put some numbers in to see what change it's gonna to make to the pH of the solution. We're being asked to calculate the change in pH on adding 0 0.01 moles of HCl to a one liter solution of a buffer containing five molar sodium acetate and five molar acetic acid. And of course, we have to have the Ka value given to us. Okay. So the question is, you've got a buffer solution and you're throwing into it 0 0.01 molar HCl what change in pH will it make, if any? Right, so now we're really gonna calculate and see, is it gonna make a change in the pH? We apply the Henderson-Hasselbach equation to the initial buffer solution, meaning before somebody has thrown in the 0 0.01 of HCl. Okay, so pH is pKa, meaning the negative log of this, plus the log of that quotient. And notice, because this is five and this is five, we get the log of one. And what is the log of one? Correct, correct, Andrew. And anyone else who thinks it's zero, right? One is 10 to the power zero which means that that term is effectively dropping out of the picture. And we end up with pH equals pKa. Okay. This is, if you like, a coincidence. Or in cases where acid and conjugate base concentration of the buffer solution are exactly equal, you get the log of one, the log of one is zero. So we, we have a simplified situation where pH is simply equal to pKa. So that's the pH of my buffered solution before any intruding H plus has been added. 
Now we're going to do the calculation again to see what actually happens on the addition of the H plus. To do this, we need an equilibrium calculation, which involves this. We've got the conjugate base, CH3CO minus, plus H plus gives undissociated acid. Notice the very particular way that this has been put, right? We're starting with the conjugate base. In previous examples, the conjugate base always appeared on the right, but for this purpose, the conjugate base is being put on the left. So what is it initially? And by initially, I mean after the addition of the 0.01, right? The, ve the, the very first instant after somebody's thrown in that 0.01, what are the concentrations? Well, five and five and 0 0.01. When that reaction goes to equilibrium, what happens? Now, 0 0.01 of H plus is going to react with exactly 0 0.01 of this ion. It's a one-to-one -one reaction, according to the stoichiometry. So how much of this will be left at equilibrium? Right? Well, 5 minus x, or 5 five minus 0 0.01, meaning 4.99. What about on the right-hand side? At equilibrium, we'll not just have five, but we'll have five plus X, which amounts to 5.01. Okay, there's a plus X on this side and it's a minus X on that side. And the X happens to be this value. Here, of course, it's gone. It's been knocked out. It's been eaten up by the conjugate base. So now let's do the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation once more to see if the pH has changed or not. pH is pKa plus the log of that quotient. That stays the same, but that doesn't stay the same. It's no longer five divided by five. It's now 4.99 divided by 5.01. This is not the log of one. This is not a zero anymore. This is this value when you calculate it. And now when you subtract this from this, you have an interesting outcome. Namely, it makes no difference. Okay, it makes, let me rephrase that. It makes no significant difference. It has technically made a difference, but it's so small. And after all, we're working to two significant figures. That the two significant figures, the pH is still 4.74. So has it made a change? Yes, but it's so small that it is literally insignificant. So no change in pH. But we've, we've shown it. We've not just claimed it, right? The quantitative is always better than the qualitative. Being able to characterize it in numerical values is much, much more powerful than just waving your hands and saying, oh, the pH will stay the same, like I did kind of did earlier. Okay, any questions on any of that? Okay, so this, in this instance, there was no effective change. But that doesn't mean that that's always going to be the case. What if the concentrations were not five and five, but supposing it had been 0.1 and 0.1? Well, then I can guarantee you that that would have resulted in a change in pH. So now we see an additional requirement of a buffer solution. Not only must it be a weak acid and its conjugate base, but in addition, the concentrations of those two things must be high. And this goes back to my picture. The column, the blue and the pink column had to be high, tall, in order for that change to be insignificant. 
So concentrations of five and five are large concentrations. <clears throat> if you had started with concentrations of 0.1 and 0.1, that wouldn't have worked, right? <clears throat> so this is a more detailed account of how buffers work. <coughs> they may or may not work in a given situation. There's no blanket statement, they will always work. They won't. Um, professor, do you mind repeating again? <clears throat> Sorry, um, how or why you wrote the reaction equation starting with the conjugate basis first? Because I want to see how the H plus is being eaten up. And to do that, the thing that's eating it up or reacting with it is the conjugate base. This goes back to early, all those earlier explanations here. You see, what, what does uh, H plus react with? Well, it X reacts with X minus. So we've got to take this version of the equation if we're examining this direction of change. Okay, thank you. Okay. We could have, we could have treated the OH minus case but then we would have started with the undissociated acid. Okay. But we've chosen, in my example, to, to treat this rather than that. Okay. All right. Anybody else have a question? Okay, we're nearly, oh, good. Well, we've, we've now finished the work on buffers. We're not obviously not gonna begin the work on titration calculations. So let me just open it up for more questions. And let me just backtrack to the very beginning of this lecture today and just do a review of everything we've covered. We started with the common ion effect to be able to see that the addition of a common ion suppresses the ionization of, for example, a weak acid. We saw that in a quantitative way. Right? The addition of, in this case, uh, H plus did suppress the ionization of this acid. It went from this value to a value about five times as low. A buffer solution contains a common ion. The conjugate base of a weak acid is an example of the common ion. We also did this via Le Chatelier's principle. This also showed that the common ion pushes the equilibrium towards the left. It suppresses the ionization of the acid. Okay, then we went into buffer solutions proper. A buffer solution is typically a weak acid and its conjugate base, such as this and this, or a weak base and its conjugate acid. But the whole the rest of the lecture concentrated on these kind of buffers rather than these. I could have done it for weak bases just as well. There you would be dealing with a KB. There you would be dealing with OH minus instead of H plus. But the treatment would be completely analogous. It was mentioned that biology has buffer solutions. Saliva has a buffer to, to maintain the pH of saliva within a narrow range, blood has a buffer, many, many bio, uh, biological mechanisms involve buffer solutions. I then began to explain in a qualitative way how a buffer works. And this gives the impression that a buffer works 100% in every case, right? Because it was, it was simply stated that if OH minus comes, excuse me, I'm about to sneeze. So. No, I'm not. <coughs> oh, excuse me. In the case of OH minus ions that are being thrown in, it was claimed that the OH minus will react with the undissociated acid and therefore no change in pH. Right? Otherwise, that would change the pH because OH minus added to the H plus in the original solution changes the amount of H plus that remains, therefore changes the pH. Well, it's being diverted away. It's being eliminated. 
And it was claimed that on the addition of H plus, the excess conjugate base would eliminate that additional H plus. And you may have come away with the impression at that stage that the buffer solution works perfectly in all cases. But as we've just seen, no, that needs to be qualified by a quantitative treatment. I mentioned that there is a dual, there's a sense in which the buffer serves a dual purpose or has a dual nature. Weak acid will remove OH minus, conjugate base will remove H plus. That's still true when it works. We then looked at the derivation of henderson hasselbach which basically involves starting with this and taking negative logs on both sides and seeing what emerges. And what emerges is this. This, of course, will be given in exam questions. We did a worked example in which we substituted values in and we calculated the pH. We did another worked example. And in this worked example, the ratio happened to be 10. So the log of 10 was easy, it was one. You don't need a calculator for that log. You do need a calculator for that log, of course. And there was the value of the buffer solution. Then we said, well, how does this quantitative treatment or how does the expression involved in the henderson hasselbach give us a quantitative explanation? And I mentioned that it was all about this ratio. We have a ratio of the buffer solution initially and on adding H plus or OH minus, that ratio changes slightly, or we hope that it changes slightly if we're trying to maintain a constant pH. We saw that demonstrated graphically on this, right? So what we do is we make sure that these two concentrations are high is so that the change is relatively small. And then we did it quantitatively. And in our example, we began with a solution that had five and five, which meant that there, this was, uh, in any case, whatever the, the details of this, the pH was 4.74 to begin with. And then on the addition of H plus, the ratio changed just slightly with the result that that log term is no longer a zero, it is now this, which means that in principle, there is a change in pH, but in practice, it is an insignificant change. Therefore, this is a successful buffer solution. It did the job we asked it to do, namely maintaining the pH. If we had asked a solution with 0.1 and 0.1, you might even, just as an exercise, try it for 0.1 and 0.1, try it for one and one, try it for two and two, right? And see just how much difference it makes in each of those cases. All right, any further questions? Yes. Um, is there a uh, henderson hasselbach equation for uh, weak bases and their conjugate acids? Correct. And it will be POH equal, equals PKB log of conjugate acid and your original base. Right? So if you like precisely the opposite at each point in that equation. POH equals PKB plus log, as I said, your base will go there and your conjugate acid will go there. Yes, absolutely right. Thank you. Welcome. If you can have buffers with a weak base, wouldn't its conjugate acid be a strong acid? So how would it still work? Uh, 
that won't matter because the thing um, the thing on the right hand side is not what's doing the buffering it's the thing on the it's the undissociated thing that's doing the buffering so in the in the case that you're considering the weak base will be undissociated that's what a weak base means that's all that's required okay that makes sense because right. you're only dealing with the weak base or the weak acid and not um the conjugate yes well i mean the conjugate is there in the equilibrium mixture but it is not important for that to be weak right that makes sense it's, it's still important because it's serving the other purpose of of mopping up the other kind of added iron Okay. Professor? Uh, yes, Ibrahim. Can I ask uh, a question, please? Yep. Okay, so we need to have a weak base for a buffer solution uh, to work, right? Uh, not quite, no. Mm. Weak acid or a weak base, right? We can't have a strong acid. Correct, or a strong base. Okay, and another question is, in this example that's on this slide, um, why did the H plus get consumed totally? Like, who told us it's a, like... A one-to-one one -one reaction? Yeah. The, the stoichiometry told us. No, not the one-to-one not the one -one reaction. Like, isn't it a reversible reaction? Like, shouldn't well, we calculate X and KB in this case? Well, and... I, have, I, I have effectively done that. Because if this is initial, right, then this is minus x and this is plus x. Yeah, but why is x h plus, like the concentration of h plus? Shouldn't we do the calculations as we normally did? Ah, for does anybody know the answer to that? Is it because CH3COO minus is in excess? Like, no, it's because it's a strong acid. And if it's the strong acid has that concentration, as stated in the question, right, 0 0.01 moles of HCl in one liter. But the real point is it's a strong acid. Therefore, it's all ionized. Therefore, I can immediately conclude that my H plus is indeed the same value. This goes back to when we began these calculations in a previous lecture, or maybe two, when it was a strong acid or a strong base, it was very easy to calculate pH because we assumed 100% ionization. That's what takes me from there to there. It's fully ionized. Now, if we had thrown in a weak acid, we could still have done the calculation, but it would have been a lot more elaborate because we would have had to have worked out this number, typically by solving a quadratic equation. And then you would have to put that into there. And Professor, are the concentrations of the conjugate acid and conjugate base, like in the henderson hasselbach equation, are they like at equilibrium or are they the initial concentrations? Um, they are the initial concentrations. Okay, thank you. Here we're considering them as the initial concentrations in this further equilibrium reaction, following the addition of the little amount of H plus. But yes, the, the answer to your question is, well, of course, here they're not, right? Here they're the equilibrium values. Okay, so okay let, let's rephrase it. If yeah. you're simply calculating the pH of a buffer solution, then you're using the initial values. If you're calculating the outcome or the resulting pH after the addition of H plus or OH minus, then we're considering equilibrium values. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, Professor? Yeah. So if um, we were to add H plus to this um, equation right here, then we would need to have an excess of the CH3COO minus in order to um, 
counteract that? Yes, but of course, a buffer solution has got that because a buffer solution contains not just the what the this that's come from the ionization of the acetic acid, but the deliberately added conjugate base. So. Okay, so we just assume that every time we have this um, buffer solution, there's an excess of the conjugate base? We, we don't just assume it. We're, I mean, we're told that in the question because we're told in the question, five molar acetic and five molar acetate. And that, that tells you that because you've got the acetate coming from there and you've got the acetate coming from there. In other oh. words, we're in good shape. Yes, so we assume it, but we're... We're doing more than assuming it. We're being informed of that fact. Okay, and then the conjugate base is the common um, ion in yes. this region. But yes. then in the beginning, when we talked about um, common ions, we said that it would um, change the pH. Or well, we we said it would suppress the concentration, the ionization of the weak acid. Yeah. But we didn't say any, anything more than that. I don't think there's anything inconsistent in saying okay. that. Thank you. Okay. All right. I will let me stop the recording. Or, or just, just let me ask, how was the midterm? How did you find it? Two thumbs up from somebody. Two thumbs up from somebody else. It was all right. All right. It was, it was pretty okay. It was good. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Did you have enough time? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was good to have the extra time just with the having to scan it all in. Sometimes the technical issues. I know. That. I know. Uh, yeah. I had everything that could have gone wrong went wrong with the really? scanning. <laughs> what, is, what is the most critical step? What is the most annoying step in that whole process? Is it the... The submitting to grade scope? Scanning the exam. Oh, no, yeah, taking the pictures. Yeah. And sending it to your, like, to your email. Yeah. yeah. I think the email stuff is really hard. Sometimes it like doesn't send through. Uh, yeah. Really long time to get your email. <laughs> yeah, I had to submit it with like a couple minutes there, so my anxiety was pretty high. So yeah. wait, let me try and understand that, okay? Because, so you've got the PDF file on CCLE. Yeah, yeah, but I can print it. And then you click onto that. Can you not just print from there? Yeah, we print it we and print then it. Solve, it, solve it on paper. Then we need to scan it using our phones. Okay. Yeah. So when we scan it, we need to convert it to a PDF through an app. And then we need to send it by email to ourselves, to, like to our inbox. So yeah. that we can the email it. usually... Yeah, the email takes a bit of time to get to like inbox because the file is very large. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, of course, that's why we gave an extra hour. Yeah. That was that was time. So, all right. Worked out. <laughs> thank you, Professor. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And not too many surprises in the questions. Nothing. All right. Good. That's what yeah. we. That's what we tried to do. Yeah. The okay. only thing. Professor, is um, um, because I was writing directly on the paper, I wrote really big because I'm not used to writing directly on the iPad. So I didn't have enough space to show all my work and I was scared that that would like mean that I didn't get full credit. No, it's a, it'll be okay. It'll okay. Be. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Okay, yeah. well, have a, have a great weekend. See you next week. Professor? Bye. Have a good Bye. Bye. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Professor? Sure. Uh, Ibrahim. Yeah. Did you look into that uh, multiple choice question? Not yet. Not yet? Okay. I haven't had a chance. I've been dealing with, with emails from students who had various issues of the kind you've been describing. Okay. All right. Thank you, Professor. Bye-bye. Thank you. Be safe. Thank you.